We've, we've heard some, from some students already about their perspective um, in provision for young people in archaeology and we've heard from some organisations. So mine's going to be a little bit different. It's going to be a paper sort of split in half in terms of what, what my experience has been as an early career archaeologist and uh, what provision I've tried to provide for, for young people. So um, I thought just to start, I'm going to run over um, what exactly what provision there is exactly out there for young people um, with an interest in archaeology. So um, the first one I've got up there is a school curriculum. I think mo pro most of you probably know that in about 2014, uh, um, the curriculum for schools changed to include the more distant past. Uh, and this is great because um, it, it's now put a formal emphasis um, on heritage education has increased the understanding of archaeology for a much younger audience, which is brilliant. But we've also got stuff, um, we've heard from Mike already about the Young Archaeologist Club. Um, and I'm going to talk about a case study later for my Young Archaeologist Club in Leeds. And I think James is probably going to talk about YAC2, uh, which is a slightly older version for um, older students, for the young archaeologists. But they also have something called the Young Leaders, which again we've heard about, which is provision for the slightly older age group. Uh, we've also got other clubs that exist, um, and they function very much like young archaeologist groups, but are, are more or less independent. And this is stuff like uh, the Durham Archaeology Explorers and things like that. We've also got family events, um, which also provides provision for, for young people. And this is stuff like the Festival for British Archaeology and uh, Heritage Open Weekends. And these, these, these events, are some events here are specifically put on for young people. So for instance, I don't know how many of you have heard of Minology, which is um, archaeology and Minecraft combined, which is put on specifically just for young, young children and, and young adults interested in Minecraft and archaeology together. Uh, we've also got work experience, so when you're trying to decide whether you want a career in archaeology, work experience is really, really key for that. Um, it helps you gain more experience, and in my experience, most archaeological companies are actually quite happy to, to um, get you to come along and give you an experience of what it's going to be like as an arch having archaeology as a career. Then we've got universities, things like uh, Although this is mostly formal education, there's um, also different types of extracurricular activities along with your studies like ARC, SOC um, and um, field, field schools as well. There's also different types of qualifications. You can, uh, there's now um, MVQs you can do and the Museum of London Archaeology, who we work with, actually have um, 12 MVQ students, four of which are in the 16 to 25 age group um, or working for them. And there's also traineeships with other units, um, places like Oxford Archaeology and Headland all do them. Um, and then community projects. These um, are probably the basis for much of, um, much of the work experience that a lot of young people get when they're, they're trying to decide whether or not archaeology is the career for them. So quickly, a bit about who I am. This is me on a, a lovely muddy foreshore in Cleethorpes where there's a, a beautiful submerged forest um, and a a lovely little trackway. Um, I'm, I, I graduated from, from Bradford University in 2013 and since then I've worked for various ar different archaeological companies. In 2013 I started with Archaeological Services YS which is a commercial unit based in Leeds um, and, I, and um, I started there um, doing a community archaeology trainee placement. So Mike spoke earlier about the Skills for Future community bursaries. I actually was one of the 51 um, uh, 51 uh, people who actually got one of those and, and undertook it at Archaeological Services. Uh, they kept me on until January of this year and then in March of this year I became a citizen archaeologist. Um, uh, I'm also a founder and a branch assistant for the Leeds Young Archaeologist Club. So that's just a little bit about who I am and, and how I've got to where I am now. Um, in regards to provision, um, in terms of my experience, um, I'd probably start with work experience. This is me on, um, on a dig in York. I don't know how many of you have, have heard of the Archaeology Live Hungate dig. That's, that's me, <laughs> um, digging away. Um, and um, one pro prohibitive aspect of, uh, for young people and getting some real archaeological experience is actually age. Most, uh, arch um, archaeological, most sites won't let anyone under the age of 16 on there for health and safety and insurance issues, which is quite prohibitive when you're younger than that and you want to get some experience. Um, and it, it makes it rather inaccessible for those, those, those age groups. 
Uh, my first experience was actually in 2017 as a worker experience student um, and right up until until I was commercially employed as a graduate I continued to get it. Um, well, well it's important to have this experience um, oh sorry why is it important it, I should say it's because if you don't if young people if they don't know whether archaeology is the career for them um, it helps them decide whether this is the right thing to do, whether it find new things that they can excel and have different opportunities within it. Um, my experience at the time asking commercial units if I could shadow them or take part was positive and most units are really, really keen to get young people in, to, to in, into the profession and to supervise placement students, always trying to give them a variety in terms of activities they do to help them realise that there are there is more than just digging to archaeology. There's so many different career paths as part of it. Um, and it's it's a, more of a vocational degree than than probably uh, most jobs out there. Um, universities vary in, in terms of their field work requirements. Um, and in my opinion, the more they offer, the better. Uh, the, there's a better chance of being employed the more experience you have. And commercial units want people with the jobs. Most of them ask for at least three months ex uh, commercial experience. Uh, it's very difficult to, difficult to get that if you're only required to do a two-week dig um, for the whole of your university career. Um, Bradford um, has an optional four-year degree with a placement year, which I undertook. And I think Winchester and Bournemouth are the only other two universities that I know of that actually do something similar. And I'm just confused about and amused why why not all universities do this because it makes your students extremely employable and Bradford offer not not just they don't just offer it for archaeology they do it for stuff like um, accountancy and things like that and they have been doing it for almost 40 years and um, the year I graduated 2013 90, uh, sorry 86.4 percent of the graduates in the year went on to further study um, or employment um, and in 2014, 95% of the archaeology graduates were employed or in higher education. And that's the, I think the numbers testify about how employable it makes people who have these skills. Um, Bradford, like, like other universities, does offer a mandatory field school, but they have also added on an extra module while I was there, which was the advanced field work, which again gives you that, that little bit extra experience. Um, when I had undertook my placement, um, I did. Um, I worked with a commercial unit for six months, getting my experience um, there. So I, I was employable as a field archaeologist from that. I also worked in a historic environments record, so I could understand um, how that worked, how the process of um, planning applications worked, what happened to the data after the the, the archaeology has been dug and um, and analysed. Um, and also, I also worked on the research project, a research project within Bradford. Um, so that's kind of kind of what I did. <laughs> um, then in 2013, I applied for um, the final rounds of the community bursary training uh, placement, which was uh, the HLS Skills of uh, Future project. And this was hosted by the C uh, CBA. Um, and there were 51 placements between 2011 and 2014, and 24 of these were youth focused. Um, mine was a 2014 cohort, and I was the final lot the final lot and the final lot of youth focused ones as well and I was based at archaeological services. Um, being a recently new graduate, having only graduated in 2013 and applying for this job the same year, um, it was a great opportunity for me and it, it, it was an opportunity to kick start my career in community archaeology and it's just a shame that there's not more of these offered. Um, there's, there were similar internships um, offered by uh, the CIFA as well for stuff like historic buildings um, but again they seem to have sort of dried up almost. Um, they're really good to equip would-be uh, community archaeologists with skills, experience, confidence um, and um, community archaeology has been and still is on the rise and I think when Historic England did, did a survey 64 the average Per, um, uh, the average percentage for people interested in the local heritage was 64% across um, England, which is quite a large percent of people. Um, and more, job, more and more jobs are coming, becoming available in community archaeology, and the skills are becoming desirable. I've known people who've been hired for um, project office jobs and assistant supervisors based on the fact that they have a lot of community um, archaeology experience, that they know how to train people in community archaeology. Um, 
I also did a, an, an MVQ as part of my, my bursary. I found out today that I passed, so I'm very happy about that. <laughs> um, um, but um, as, part of the, um, as part of this, um, it was, it was very, I found it was very difficult to, to complete whilst you're working full time. Um, and it's designed, it's designed for a workplace learning environment, basically. And um, it's, it's done in a, um, a more formal way than the community bursary was actually undertaken. Um, the work undertaken it was for a level three MVQ uh, in archaeological practice, and it's the equivalent of the pof portfolio required to get a PCIFA membership. Um, for the CIFA and it's a great alternative to university. It allows um, the same skills to be learned whilst getting invaluable experience needed for the career. It makes archaeology as a career more accessible to prospective employees um, without the cost and the time it takes to gain a degree, particularly for those who want to work in the field just as excavators and don't want to go down any different lines. Um, after all, it's, archaeology is, is a, vocational, a vocational job much of the time. Um, I think it's well, well worth thinking about if, you, if um, a, a degree is not, not an option for you. So that's sort of just a, a, quick, a quick roundup of what provision I've experienced um, in sort of when, I, sort of when I, I started to be able to, from about the age of 16 to, to now. And I still fall within the 16 to 25 age group, which is why I wanted to give you that overview of what exactly I've experienced in the last couple of, of um, years. Um, so now I'm going to go on to sort of a bit more about um, what what provision what's preventing provision what barriers there are and um, give you a couple of case studies and how we can go about trying to improve provision for young people so firstly I want to look at um, um, what's preventing provision um, but to help help understand the case studies achieved I think we need to look look at this to see why why those the, the case studies are examples of good practice um, a lack of opportunity or um, or being unsure to get into archaeology um, is is one thing that that young people we think is preventing young people from getting involved. Um, commercial units require participants to be 16. So if you wish to experience archaeology, the um, at a younger age, there, there are a few options, and a few community proje uh, community heritage projects are actually aimed at children and young people. Um, so unless you're actively trying to get young people involved, there's really limited information out there and limited opportunity available. Um, there's also negative perceptions. Most young people relate archaeology to history at school. Uh, and if they are not interested at school, they're not inclined to try and get involved outside of school either. Spare time is another um, big one. Um, they have other commitments. If you're looking at the 16 to 25 age, age group, um, they've got school, uh, school and work commitments during the week. And um, on top of that, they have after school activities and homework, which takes quite a lot of their spare time. Um, if they've only got weekends, it's really hard to get them in a long-term involvement in an archaeological project. Um, socio-economic and cultural, um, cultural backgrounds um, sometimes prohibit them getting involved with archaeology. Some feel the heritage is not theirs and, um, and therefore they don't feel like they have the right to get involved. On top of that, some of them don't have a disposable income to be able to enjoy heritage. And, um, and sometimes pater uh, paternal attitudes can actually um, actually be a, a barrier themselves. If, if their parents are interested and disenchanted, um, they're, un they're not likely to encourage their children to get involved with heritage. Um, one other thing that I think Alara um, touched on was transport as well. A lot of young people don't have access to a car, they only have public transport. Some parents are unwilling to drive them 30 miles to go to a, a community archaeology project they're involved with. So that's another thing. Um, the final one, which um, which I've put on there, is um, barriers for adults. Um, nowadays, um, there are a lot of hoops to jump through, and this is um, there's a lot of hoops to jump through to provide uh, provision for young people. And a lot of people are kind of put off by this. They're put off by the idea of um, DBS or disclosure barring um, service. Um, they're put off by the health and safety aspect, risk assessments, because they just don't understand what they are and, and they don't feel like they, they want to do them. Uh, on top of that, many people are not inclined to give up their, their own time either, um, which is why quite a few young archaeologist clubs sometimes are struggling for, for leaders to actually take part. So my, um, my two case studies will, um, are going to demonstrate how these projects overcame barriers and are, example, are meant to be examples of, of good practice uh, for provision for young people. The examples are both based in West Yorkshire 
Um, and one example is provision from within formal education, um, which is a My Place School project, which is in Bradford and Keithley. And uh, the other one is in formal education, uh, in an informal education environment, which is the Lee Jung Archaeologist Club. Um, I'm going to do a dug right now and give you some stats. <laughs> um, I haven't got any pretty graphs to show you, unfortunately. Um, but I think it's important to, to understand the population statistics to see, um, to see why these projects were important um, in, the, in the places they were. Um, so the first one is um, Leeds and Brad Bradford are actually the third and fourth uh, largest metropolitan districts in regards to population in England um, after Birmingham and Sheffield. So they have very, very large populations. 18.5% um, of the population of Leeds are aged between 0 and 15, and that's about average um, for the size of the population. 23.5% of the population of Bradford are aged between 0 and 15, that's above average. They are the largest population group in Bradford um, of, out of all of them. And Leeds and Bradford have the second and third highest populations of 0 to 15 year olds in the metropolitan districts after Birmingham. Um, they're, they're quite large populations, so provision needs to be needs to be there for them. Um, so the first one I'm going to go on to talk about is is my place. Um, um, while we were on this, um, we did actually have a, a placement student from Bradford help us out on the second year of this. Um, that I really enjoyed this project, I thought it was brilliant. <laughs> um, so it's, uh, this is a HLF project led by the education team at West Yorkshire Joint Services uh, between 2013 and 2014 and was aimed specifically for school children in the Keithley and Bradford area. Uh, there was also the opportunity to part participate in the excavation which was led by uh, the company I was working for at the time which was Archaeological Services and I came into the project in the second year uh, and led it. Uh, the project focuses on two communities um, and it looked at local heritage of those neighbourhoods, uh, the people, the places, the memories that make up the richness, richness of those communities. And it was run in participation with Bradford Muse Museums and Galleries who provided the venue for the excavation. So we, we had two excavations, we had one in Cliff Castle which was, this is Cliff Castle here, which is um, in Keithley and it's the former house, uh, the former home of a Keithley mill owner. The other one was Bolling Hall, I don't know if any of you in Bradford have been to Bolling Hall, it's a beautiful, beautiful medieval manor house, it's gorgeous. Um, and we had over 10 days of excavation, 22 schools took part um, in the final year that I was there and um, we had up to 60 pu school pupils on the site um, in, in a day basically. Not all at the same time, because that would be chaos. <laughs> um, but in one day, we did have up to 60 um, pupils on it. Um, the, all the participants were aged between 8 and 16. So this is slightly younger than what um, Citizen and many people have been looking at today. Um, and uh, we were open for four days for the local community to visit. Um, and at one point, we had three generations all excavating on the site. And I think our youngest participant was three years old. Um, so she wasn't doing much digging, but, um, but that was the, the youngest participant we had uh, on the site. Um, there was also a morning where we had an um, inclusive archaeology group of adults, so that's adults with um, disabilities actually um, on, the, on the site to have an opportunity to come and dig. Um, the project um, was a programme working with schools including workshops, archaeological excavations, celebration events and exhibitions promoting the work and the se sessions focused on the non-physical heritage of memories and identity and the physical heritage of historic buildings, archaeological sites and museum collections and that sort of thing. Um, the main aims of the project um, were to increase and broaden participation in heritage. This is recognising um, that young people were underrepresented in community projects and that they were the, the future champions, um, to quote, um, to quote um, Bradford Council, um, on the, on, of heritage and encourage them to use and appreciate their local heritage. Uh, promote community cohesion and integration from diverse backgrounds using heritage and culture. Um, Bradford and Keithley probably have one of the most diverse populations um, in the country and the project was about bringing young people together to give them a, a, sense, of, a sense of pride and uh, ownership or, um, and belonging in their community um, and improve social cohesion and promote integration. Um, I think greater public involvement uh, in local planning and development issues. The project was about providing local communities with a better understanding of their heritage, um, and in regards uh, and the, and and the value of it as well. So that in regards to planning and development, it wouldn't be lost. So the structure of my place was it took on a formal education um, sort of. 
uh, structure um, through the schools. They had classroom sessions on um, um, on heritage, um, which were actually led by an archaeologist, so you could dispel myths. The number of times I heard the word dinosaur was incredible. Um, <laughs> and on top of that, myths, are we going to find treasure? No, no we're not. <laughs> um, uh, and they got to touch, have a chance to touch um, real um, archaeological artifacts and undertake a simulation dig. Um, they also had a chance at um, undertaking some geophysics. So those are the kids at Cliff Castle having a go with the, the machines. Um, and then uh, undertaking excavation using, and they got to use stuff like the dumpy level and do post ex washing finds, bagging finds. And then there was an, uh, the evaluation we undertook was a, um, was a bone and brick kind of method. And this recorded um, the bad points and the good points, stuff they learnt, stuff they didn't understand, those sorts of things. So um, I, I feel having facilitated and participated in this, it, there was quite a few successful points for this project. Um, the young people were able to touch and interact with heritage and touching the artefacts and the geophysical equipment enabled them to feel valued. Um, enabling them to be part of something, it's important for young people to discover and uh, to discover archaeological finds um, and they weren't particularly interesting finds um, from an archaeologist's point of view they were stuff like um, late 19th century pottery bits of coal um, clay pie stamps which to us are not hugely interesting <laughs> Laris says they are <laughs> um, but to them it was like it was like, it was like finding treasure for them stuff they, they found themselves um, they were able to relate to the place where they where they lived, where they w went to school, where they played football, um, and and it for them it, it kind of gave them an ownership and a responsibility for this heritage, and it helped them think about what they might consider um, the heritage um, in the future to be. So, for instance, I've always said to the kids in Bradford, um, look around, what do you see? You see the mills, um, but you can also see. Um, uh, church spires and mosques and to them they don't necessarily consider their mosques to be heritage but it is it's still heritage it's making up the landscape um, so it, it was about getting that idea across to them um, and finally just having a good experience with heritage and archaeology and um, just giving them a memorable experience um, and enjoyment it inspires a pride and a desire to protect the heritage and um, there are a few disadvantages to this project which I feel like I probably do have to highlight on top of that so for instance it was um, it was uh, a project that was for a set time, so it's not ongoing. And there's no way to see if there was a long-term impact on the participants um, and whether the schools and, and those who were involved continued to use the heritage assets afterwards. Um, although it engaged almost 700 people um, across the two years, there are still many people who didn't get involved and aren't necessarily appreciating or understanding heritage. Um, and finally, there's little advice given to the participants of how, how they can continue to better access other heritage assets in, in the area and how to use them educationally. So very quickly, I'm going to um, go through um, our second case study, which is the Lee Jung Archaeologist Group. This was founded in September 2014, and it stemmed from a youth group that was set up as another HLF project, uh, Parks for People project, um, uh, which is a regeneration of parks. Um, quite a lot of parks actually undertake this scheme, so you might know some of them. Um, it was originally set up and led by myself and colleagues from ASYS and um, in the initial six month period, and it was known as Middleton Park History Detectives um, and became a yak sort of um, af after these six months. Um, and until, but until 2014, there was no yak in Leeds or Bradford. Um, so if you think back to the statistics I told you, the second and third highest uh, number of young people in the metropolitan districts in England after Birmingham and there was no young archaeologist or archaeological provision for young people um, in form of a yak group which is quite incredible <laughs> in my mind. Um, as part of the HLF project, the Middle Park School project, it was to educate local children on the history of the park and the legacy was this youth group. Um, and it was um, set up in Middleton Park um, to engage with kids from possibly a less affluent background. Um, and get them to interact with the archaeology. I don't know how many of you know Leeds, but Middleton is probably one of the less affluent areas. We could have set it up in any bit of Leeds, and we would have, but we would have got the, the more affluent kids to, the, to there anyway. We wanted to get the kids in the local area to interact with their local heritage. So um, the Council for British Archaeology, um, we've already heard Mike speak, um, their mission statement is archaeology for all and um, YAC encompasses this by allowing access for young people and it allows um, as part of this identifying and breaking down what barriers so um, so there are more specific aims for YAC um, there's it's 
ability to be able to spark and test, maintain and develop and grow it, um, an appreciation and understanding of the heritage through the enjoyment of it. And um, to create future advocate, uh, advocates and long-term stewards of heritage, uh, like my place, it recognises the young people are the future of heritage and therefore uh, appreciation and responsibility of the heritage is key. Provide a youthful and skilled workforce in the heritage sector, but to provide, by providing the members uh, with skills and training that archaeologists and heritage professionals require. Um, and in doing so, keep the developed uh, sustainability for the sector and minimise the skill gaps and facilitate and empower young people, provide them with skills, uh, enabling young people to feel valued and make contributions to the archaeological knowledge and also to champion local involvement and engagement in heritage. And then just allowing them to, to enjoy the heritage and in do so take ownership and pride in their, in, in their local heritage. So we, we always try and uh, implement this uh, in, a, in a number of ways. We do creative topics and we allow members to guide their own learning. So um, this, this set of uh, sessions we've just set up, we're going to look at Egyptology, Victorians and military history because that's what they've asked us to look at. Um, but we're also going to in, uh, introduce as aspects of archaeology that didn't know exist. So for instance, we're going to look at the archaeology of ancient woodlands, we're going to look at um, intertidal archaeology and we're going to look at buildings archaeology. Um, and we're going to keep it relative to them. We're going to use heritage assets like local parks, local churches and buildings, um, local museums. Um, we're going to get them to enjoy the heritage in a fun way through games and crafts and a bet get a, therefore get a better understanding and to revisit topics which can allow them development for further skills and sustainability. So this is, this is them uh, doing bones, making pots, making couple of ring mat rocks, looking at buildings, that sort of thing. Um, there are a few successes to, to highlight here. Um, by providing an ongoing progressive experience, um, we're empowering and providing skills to the members to help them develop um, relevant archaeological skills like planning and uh, identification for finds um, and, and their development in the future heritage sector. Um, having an archaeologist as a leader um, allows for further development. They sort of have a mentor there, they can ask questions. Um, allow them responsibility and ownership of the club. Um, give them the responsibility to help the younger people, um, to photograph, um, to document what's going on, write blogs, that sort of thing. Um, and, and, and enabling them to contribute to archaeological research. Um, we undertake experimental archaeology, we've made butter, um, but we've, we've also gone out and uh, recorded the local war memorial, um, which wasn't um, up on, there's, uh, I think it's war memorials, website where you can upload war memorials and who's on it and stuff. We went and did that with them um, and, and just ultimately provide them a really an enjoyable experience. Um, I'm going to quickly, the last couple of slides. Um, uh, so why is it important to create archaeological provision for young people? Um, I want to look at this in two parts. The first one is in regards um, to the archaeology. Um, young people are the future of heritage management and by inspiring a sense of ownership, responsibility and appreciation of heritage in the young, we safeguard and preserve the, the heritage in the future. But there's also a way to look at it in terms of young people um, and providing young people with the opportunities, experience and transferable skills. We can provide a better quality of life, enhance understanding of different environments and cultures and enrich uh, their future. But there are things we can do to improve improve the provision. We could, um, if we value the ideas and the opinions of the young, um, many of them already have a passion in heritage um, and they have their own ideas so there's no point in ignoring them, we might as well get them involved, ask what their ideas are um, and help facilitate, facilitate them and use what they value as important. Um, so in Bradford the mosques are important to them because it's part of their religion, use the mosques um, and use the churches and use the mills which they all identify and they see every single day. Um, more, uh, more opportunity for, um, for engagement and access, both in formal and informal education. Um, the Festival of British Archaeology has specific events for families, like I said, like the minority one. Um, but there's find more creative ways to fit it in to the curriculum um, or um, things like Octon, which Lara was talking about with the body guides. Um, greater access to the information on careers and involvement. Um, Look at the technology, um, how technology can be used. So, for instance, 3D mod modelling or using uh, una, um, UAVs, which is una, unmanned, air, uh, what is it, unmanned? Yes, <laughs> that one. <laughs> um, uh, and using the media. 
advocate for, for young people in archaeology, um, target groups, find ways to get young people included in archaeology. For example, um, ESOL and, and look at migration. I've always talked to the kids in Bradford who, who said, this isn't my heritage. Um, you know, my parents or my grandparents only came over uh, not so long ago. And it says, well, the, originally um, the Normans came over. Um, none of them could speak English. Um, you're learning English the same way that they will have had to have learned to communicate with people and, and tackle it from, from that sort of angle. Um, reduce the financial um, constraints. Um, um, YAC, we always have really low subs and discounts for, um, for young people um, and there are specific funding streams like Young Roots set up um, for better, uh, to finance sort of projects. Um, better training for adults, by removing the barriers to provide provision, um, you can increase the opportunities, better, better training them to understand the procedures um, and good practice um, for giving them the right skills. Um, just to finish off really, really quickly, because I'm aware I've probably gone quite far over <laughs> over time. Um, this is the sort of thing citizens are doing for young people. Um, we're targeting groups along the coast. So, for instance, um, um, Yak is at the top of this. We've done Sheffield, Newcastle. We're doing Leeds and York in in the new year. But we're also looking at coastal groups like the Sea Cadets and Beach Cleaners. Um, we're finding ways to fit it into the curriculum. So, for instance, my lovely submerged forest at the beginning. Um, we're hopefully going to go talk to some some Year Threes who are studying prehistory in Cleethorpes and um, talk to them about prehistory and submerged forests and that sort of thing. Um, but you could also look at um, GCSE and A level geography students. Uh, geophysics um, could be an app. Uh, uh, an applied use for A-level students learning physics. Um, provide volunteering sk skills enhancement um, by acting as an incentive with our um, skills passports, but also volunteering opportunities for DUV. Um, and provide a modern and technological approach. Most of what we do is accessible by the internet. We use social media, e-updates, we blog. The archaeological data is um, accessible as an interactive map um, on the website. We have a we're getting the, um, the smartphone app at some point, which will bring it in line with modern technologies. And then using technologies like UAVs and 3D modeling um, helps it um, be of interest to, to more young people. And that is the end. And I'm very sorry for um, talking for so long. <laughs>